So retiming a similar function to the one that we started with, right? So what's the difference over here? If you look at it carefully, you'll notice that now I have OC1 being used by A to produce OA1. That in turn is used by B to produce OB1, used by C to produce OC, OC1. Okay. So now what happened? Effectively, this OC1 is what is going to get used by A the next time around. So if I have once again this for loop where I keep calling the stop function, right? What I will have is a graph that looks something like this, right? A consumes, this is the init value. Okay. So this D that I have over here is precisely this initial value token which is OC1, which is consumed by A and it produces OA1. That is consumed by B, which produces OB1. Okay. So because that initial token, that init value C was present on the edge between C and A, I do not have deadlock. A can actually execute the first time around. And after it does that, it then produces a sequence of outputs, which then proceed without any problem okay now as far as this particular graph is concerned remember it's a recursive graph right that is it has a cycle so i can compute some you know this iteration period bound right there is only one cycle over here so it's basically going to be equal to ta plus tb plus tc divided by the number of delays over there which is one so in other words, effectively what this is telling me is because of the fact that it has this one delay on it, no matter what I do, right, the time required per iteration is cannot be less than TA plus TB plus TC. Okay. And in this case, basically my critical path that I have over here, right, if I look at it, the critical path is the direct delay from A to B to C without any delay elements or storage on it, right. So this critical path is going to be equal to TA plus TB plus TC. Okay. So effectively, what is it telling us? That one iteration of this system, according to the critical path, takes time TA plus TB plus TC. But I have further the information that the iteration period bound itself is TA plus TB plus TC. So in other words, this is already doing the best that it can. Now, what I want to sort of do looking at this is to say, right, let's look at possible, you know, the execution of this thing, assuming that A, B and C are, you know, effectively separate uh, hardware units, right? I have, in other words, the way that I've drawn it over here, this C minus one is the init value, right, which is used by A0, that in turn is used by B0 then used by C0 and that output is used by A1, right? That's precisely what I'm seeing over here. This C0 output is then going to be used by A, okay? And then once again, you know, it goes on like that. And I can then think of this as iteration zero, which is basically the A0 plus B0 plus C0, then iteration one and so on. Now, what if I rewrite my code a little bit like this, right? I now have, you know, I have, basically the modification that I have made is that I now take OA1 as my init value. And now if you look at the sequence, first B, then C, then A. Okay. B has to be first because basically B is the one that can work given that, you know, there is an init value from A, right? And the corresponding graph looks like this. What has happened? The only difference between this graph and this graph is the location of the initial value token, right? So essentially what I have done is I have moved the initial value from the CA edge to the AB edge, okay? This is an example of what I am calling 
free timing. Okay, why do I call it re timing? If you look at the timing chart once again, now you will notice that this is the init value A, right, which is used by now B0, C0, and then A0. So effectively, if you look at it, you know, what has happened with respect to the previous one is uh, what I considered to be the A0, B0, C0 that I have over here, that sequence, the A0 has now gone to the last computation, right? It, the A0 has been shifted to the end of the computation, that is because it is what is computed in iteration 0, but if you look at it, this is effectively, this was the old, uh, this would have been and effectively all that we are saying is as long as I have chosen my init value A appropriately, I can get exactly the same sequence of outputs as what I would have had in the previous case. It is just that the order in which they get computed has been changed. The functionality, the final outputs that I am going to create are not changed in any way. It is only the order in which these outputs are being generated. I can do this further. I could also shift this around and now basically say the init value has moved to here, to the C to B to CH. Right? And by moving this, what do I get? I now have a timing graph which looks like this. Now this init value B is being used by C, by C0, right? And then C0, A0, B0 is what is being computed in the first iteration. After which I basically have you know the same pattern of data being generated once again. So the point of this was basically to indicate that in, by choosing appropriate values of these initial conditions, right? So in this init value A, init value B, init value C have to be chosen appropriately. I need to put the correct values in there. But by doing so, I can basically get the same kind of behavior from whichever one of these orders that I use, okay? Now, what is the purpose of this? Why would I actually want to do something of this sort, right? In order to understand that, we need to look at how this can be applied in a more general context. How can you apply the same idea of moving the delay element or the initial condition around, right? To a more uh, general form of, uh, to a more general graph and to sort of see what would be the impact when you do it that way, right? The basic idea that we have applied over here is called timing right and all that we have done is basically this sort of moving the starting point around right from yeah in in this particular version of the uh, uh, graph c is the one that is the starting point in the previous one b was the starting point and before that a was the starting point each of them are basically retimed versions of the same data flow graph the same functionality but they each have slightly different uh, interpretations, although the final outputs are essentially the same. You know, this idea that we have over here is basically a generalization of the idea of pipelining, right? In other words, how you can look at pipelining as a subset of this, as a special case of this retiming, and also how it can be used in in general for other, you know, for improving the critical path in slightly more complicated graphs as well.